Hi, Wolf. Are you there? Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, nice to meet you too. Even um, in, in, in this very atypical way. <laughs> <laughs> I just prefer a personal contact, but anyway. Yes, it. <laughs> but it's impossible now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think you don't have your video camera open on, so I can I can see you. Yes, but I can't see myself. You can see yourself, but not us. <laughs> <laughs> so try to make any arrangement just to no, find you. No, I can you. see I can see you, but not me. Oh no! <laughs> Let's try a little bit. We have just some seconds, minutes, even to find a way. I mean, the, the most important thing is that, is is that you your presentation and you. No, no tiene la cámara conectada. Disculpa, Javier. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, Tony, uh, tell me that uh, your video camera is off. It's not uh, okay. working. Just a moment. Okay. Um, usually it starts by itself. Yeah. yeah. But you see me now? No. Um, not yet. Camera works. Not works. Let's give some seconds just to. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Perhaps we need uh, you need to restart the connection with uh, by some. Okay. I I don't know I don't know. Uh, probably take some some minutes, but uh, I can start just making your presentation to the uh, uh, assistants to the public. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's okay for you. Yes. Yeah, because we we want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, let's try let's try another another connection. Okay. Okay. Go. Uh, for the rest of a, of a, para el resto del público, uh, sí comentaros que vamos a vamos a pasar esta sesión. Uh, tengo el placer de coordinarla. Uh, vamos a hacer las presentaciones y las preguntas. Yo haré la traducción si es necesario en inglés. Y lo primero que me toca es presentaros a Wolf Hein que es, uh, he's a German uh, archaeotechnician who designs and produces scientific reconstructions that are uh, exhibited around the world. It, uh, he carries out uh, outreach work uh, for the general public and the university studying, and he plans and produces several exhibitions and has published many, many works about uh, pre prehistoric techniques. So we, we have the pleasure to have a very important person in terms of uh, how to reconstruct the past. And uh, it is just a matter to wait a little bit uh, until he uh, connect, connect in, in this second try. <laughs> you, can, you can start making your question if you want in, on the chat. Even if the presentation is not running. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Yes, it's a matter of wait for him. Okay. Wolf is is. Are you there again? Yes, yes, I started again, but um, um, I, can't, I can't start the video. I don't know why. This is a, the problem of a live connection. You know, the, those are the typical problems of, of, of uh, working with these uh, virtual methods. Let's uh, do one thing, because uh, even if we want to see you, the most important thing is just to watch your presentation. Do you have yes. any presentation? Yes, of course. Uh, so, um, do you know that uh, you need to share your screen yes, with us? Yes. So, go and see if you can share it. I will try this just a moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay, it works. It, it, it works Perfect. fine. Yeah, yeah, fine. So, uh, I will. I will say sorry for the public because we, we will not see. I, I can make, I can give them a picture of you. <laughs> Meanwhile. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I will share it. And uh, I only have to say that we lose some minutes, 
but uh, we, the, the team who prepares this seminar, want to thank you very much for your participation. Now is your turn, Wolf. Does oh. it work now? No, not now. Okay. But you see my presentation? No, 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 no. We just have your, uh, your, your uh, name on the screen. Oh. You can use the, the previous one. Yes, just a moment. We call that uh, in Spanish, problemas del director. Okay. Now we now? see something, but we, we have on the screen, we have the slides, but not in the presentation mode. But anyway, we can okay. see what, if you minimize now, now it works. Perfect. Okay, fine. So, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so you can start when you want. Yes, okay. Um, I have to get back to my other screen because I work from the laptop. Uh, yes, dear friends and colleagues, good afternoon, everybody. Buenos dias a todos. <laughs> Thanks to the Museum of Archaeology of Catalonia and all the other organizers for inviting me to join this online seminar. It's a great honor for me to speak to you all. And special thanks to Anna and Anthony and Javier and anybody else for your patience and for making this event possible. I was requested to talk a bit about my job as an archaeotechnician, so I will try to give an impression of my work in the last 24 years, laying the focus on the realization of prehistoric buildings like these, which I constructed for the Federsee Museum in Southern Germany in 1998. Open air museums, visitors love to see prehistoric buildings. They want to know and they want to experience how our ancestors lived. The houses generate atmosphere, the houses are charming, and enable the public to empathize in ancient times, to be part of a world long gone. Obviously, you cannot just put any building on scene. The construction has to be coherent to the epoch which is on display. So when I'm commissioned to reconstruct a building, the first step is always to do some research. Usually, I start with a drawing provided by the commissioner, a floor plan of an excavation with all the post holes still visible in the ground after thousands of years. So I know how big the building was and if the excavator was working thoroughly, how deep the posts were founded in the ground. But flipped and seen from the side, this tells us nothing about how the superstructure of the house looked like. We have no information how high it was, nor how and with, with which material the single construction elements were connected, nor how the roof was thatched. Actually, and to be honest, there is nothing to reconstruct. All we can offer with a clear conscience is a construction, a model, which in the best case can be a more or less close approach to the prehistoric reality. So how do we come to an hypothetical model which is plausible enough to match the presumed ancient design? And how can we translate this model into a physical object such as this Bronze Age house we produced in spring 2020? It was right before the Corona Academy. We just jumped through the door and went back home after having finished this building. So first let's have a look at the facts. There are so many factors influencing a reconstructor before he starts doing one single stroke of the pen. You have to deal with financial possibilities. How money can the commissioner spend on erecting a house? You have to look for profitability. What do you want to do with the house? Is it to attract visitors or is it just an experiment? It depends on the manual skills of the manufacturer. Nobody is capable of um, building Stone Age houses. Nobody is even capable of being a carpenter besides being trained to it. 
the durability is a factor. Do you want the house to stand for about 50 years by using modern methods like nails and screws and concrete fundaments in the ground? Or do you want to have a house like made with ancient techniques standing just in the ground and the posts will rot over the time and get decayed? The next thing is individual understanding of history. What is your view of your personal view of history? How is your, your, your view or, or your picture you draw in your mind about archaeological science or the epoch you're dealing with? And this is also influenced by the current view of history, the general view of history in your society. Then we come to operational safety. A house should be safe for the visitors, not that anybody in, enters the house and the roof comes down because of any faults while having constructed it. The very important part is environment protection. You cannot cover the posts going to the ground with tar or any fluid with poison in it if the house stands in a natural environment protection area. It must be visitor friendly. People with wheelchairs should be able to enter the house and have a look around. You have to abide to building law regulations. A house cannot be higher than something of the museum or something else. And authorities are very quick with uh, making new problems. Geography, environment, climate is clear. You cannot put a house with a roof, which is very thin on an area or, or a region where it rains all day or, or, or for months in winter. Geology is important. If you want to put the house on posts in the ground, first you have to look into the ground, um, what happens there? What, what does the ground look like? Another very important thing is material availability. Where can we get all the beams and trunks you need for constructing the house? Where get you where do you get the roofing material? The very important thing is relevant external data. Uh, how do other houses look like or other archaeological findings in other regions look like? Can you see parallels to your house you want to build? And the most important thing is the archaeological record. What are the main facts you have to observe or you have to you have to stick to if you want to build this this building. So even if you took every factor into your considerations, you are still sailing blue water. There are still many ways of coming to a final result and a defined blueprint. For example, this is the part of an excavation plan of Alleshausen Grundwiesen, the late Neolithic settlement in southern Germany, with some very small posts over here and here and here and here. When we built the open air park at the Federsee Museum from 1998 on, we decided to erect three different superstructures on exactly the same floor plan. Thus, we were able to impart our uncertainty concerning the true look of these tiny huts to the museum visitors by offering three alternatives based on the same evidences. Next stage of the process is and has to be a thorough planning, observing all the factors mentioned previously. Of course, a trained woodworker like me has a different concept of how a prehistoric building might have been constructed than most archaeologists, which is quite normal. Everybody passed through unique professional training that has personal abilities and is specialized in a distinct way. If you look into books, whether scientific or popular, about prehistoric archaeology depicting Stone Age houses and their making of, you will find a lot of, let's call it, uncertainties. As for details of joining wooden elements or treating construction materials the right way, the ideas range from wishful thinking to impossibilities. 
Sometimes it lacks in spatial imagination, sometimes in knowledge about wood and how to use it properly. Here, the rafters are fixed to the purlin by using branches as hooks. Nice in theory, but a bad idea in reality. This way, the upper thin ends of the tree used as rafters are pointing downwards. But at this spot, the most weight of the roof is applied. So the rafters will break soon. And why would you put the battens under the rafters? Or is it a second level of rafters and what for? I don't know, it was just a drawing in an archeological book and I was very concerned <laughs> when I saw this. In this example, I wonder how the rafters should be connected to the purlin and I'm not sure how this tiny lintel should carry this big trunk on top of it. Another drawing, where's the roof overhang? If you don't have one, the rain flooding from the roof will turn the clay walls into a mud heap. And how would you connect the wicker work with the roof? This drawing is also very schematic. And if you execute the roofing like this, the straw or reed will be decomposed after only one rainy summer because the rainwater will not drain off evenly, but penetrate the roofing at the protruding steps. At this moment, I would have liked to show you some more popular illustrations with crazy ideas such as two Stone Age men carrying an oak wooden trunk of 50 centimeters diameter and six meters length on their shoulders alone. People climbing up in the timber work using ladders, which were first invented thousands of years later. The houses where people already started pelting the walls with clay, although the roofing is not finished yet and much more. But uh, due to copyright regulations, I'd better abstain from it and reprieve you with this stuff. I must confess, of course, that we made mistakes too, and we had some severe setbacks, but we learned from that in praxis and subsequently avoided these faults. As you can see here, while we were felling a big oak tree, the axe have broke. This is the moment caught in the act. We ruined several tools while experimenting but as I said, we learn from it. And this is the perfect transition to our efforts to understand new woodworking. And this is to say by experiments. The famous German philosopher Immanuel Kant stated theory without praxis is vacuous. Praxis without theory is blind. Archaeotechnicians try to combine both in an effective way. Making experiments in Stone Age houses is not is older than you may think. Already in 1879, the Danish noble Reverend C. Estate built a small hut on Brohorn on the island of Fyn, which is still standing there after more than 200 years. We have the original Neolithic tools such as axes and blades to use them experiment, but Seestate used originals. Original flint axes from Danish finding spots. An absolute no-no for present archaeologists, but at that time this was not unusual. Today, we do not have to employ ancient artifacts anymore. Modern machines make it possible to replicate almost any desired archaeological find. And if you want to find out what kind of Stone Age timber joints and constructions are feasible, you have to work with Stone Age tools, of course. Each year we, a group of enthusiasts, meet in an oak forest near Agersheim in southern Germany, testing ancient gear and techniques. We, don't, we, we do not only cut down trees up to a diameter of 60 centimeters, but also process the trunks into timber incidentally measuring and documenting working time, durability of tools, the number of single strokes, trace wear on tools and 
many much more. Here is our internet connection. If you want to visit us on the internet, you're very much welcome to do this. Our toolbox does not only contain tools made of stone, we also work with bone and antler. Here, a big bone chisel made from a moose deer, leg bone. Aside from cutting and splitting trunks, we try to do fine woodworking, strictly following the archeological finds, in this case, making a mortise and a board, which doubtly which doubtlessly is possible and just a matter of patience and endurance. Laser scans enable us to compare the results of our experiments with the archaeological finds. Meanwhile, we are about able to being to, to we are about being able to tell which tool was employed if we see the worked surface on an ancient wood construction element. Here, we uh, try to um, put um, uh, to cut a tap to a trunk, because um, if you are looking for connections between the posts and the purlins, you have to put a tap on top of the trunk, and this is what we uh, tested here. We only used uh, three tools and adds with a shoe last kelt, a wooden wedge and an antler witch, but this is all we, all we used to do this tab. It was the work of about um, one hour and 30 minutes, one and a half hour. The only question still remaining is how people back then lifted the purlin, which probably weighs more than 300 kilo, up to six meters into the air and place it precisely on the post top. We would love to once get the chance and try this without using a modern crane. As a consequence of our experimentations, we can clearly state that in the Stone Age, processed wood never looked like this chainsaw on the sacre. You can see where people cut all the beams and trunks with a chainsaw. And nobody who made just one meter of bast cord with his own hands would have ever wasted one centimeter of bast cord like they did here. This is plastic cord. If you if you did a line bast cord, you would cut them off here and uh, in advance plan that it works like this, that it works out and you use the full length of the, of the cord you made. Our constructions look different because we tested theories and praxis. I don't claim that they represent the holy truth, but I guess they are a nearer approach to the prehistoric reality. Just a moment. In most cases, we also use modern machines for timbering, subsequently erasing all traces by reworking them with ancient tools. But in spite of all respect to the skills of our ancient colleagues, we avoid producing perfect constructions we could have jumped out of a prefab house catalog like these ones you can see here. We are pretty sure that in prehistory houses were organic creations using raw material available in the direct neighborhood. Who would honestly carry a 300 kilogram trunk over kilometers through an impassable forest just because it is straight and good looking? In fact, we are sure that houses in prehistory looked more like this. This photo was taken not long ago in Anatolia. With this barn, not one single wooden element is straight, as you can see. And it is not a matter of lack of wood. There's forest around enough. Most probably the carcasses of prehistoric houses did rather look like this. House constructions can be used for archaeological uh, archaeological experiments just to a very limited extent because they are constructions. And for carrying out scientific experiments, there's no need to wear Stone Age garment. Above all, please, no socks and sandals.
A scientific experiment needs a scientific foundation, a precise research question, and in most cases, there is nothing romantic in it. If you are lucky, you have excellent equipment at hand and people skilled who are able to use it in an effective way. Here, one of our colleagues records our progress in cutting down a tree with a laser scanner. In some very rare cases, houses can be used for experiments. Here, one conducted by Danish archaeologist Jenny Marie Christensen. During several winters, she lived with a group of colleagues inside a model of a Viking house in Denmark and recorded the way of the open fire smoke in the house and the general living conditions inside the building using high-tech gear such as smoke detectors, infrared cameras, and respiratory devices. And of course, models can be suitable places to test materials and techniques apart from the actual design of the house. Since I produce constructions, I'm very interested in roofing. Reed is very often taken for thatching, even though it was not available in some places and during distant periods. So I was looking for alternative materials such as bark from different kinds of trees. This is one of our first attempts to cover a trust with lime bark at the Federsie Museum in 1999. As time went by, we changed technique. First, we fixed the bark press to the flat to the buttons. Now we use the natural curving and position of the bark stripes upside and downside in turns, leaving by doing learning by doing and never stop learning. These roofs are tight since decades. And even though experimental archaeology cannot prove anything, it can widen your horizon. In this sense, thank you for your attention. Gracias por tu atención. Thank you very much, uh, Wolf. You have been very, very adjust to the time we have. So thank you yeah. for that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so we can leave some time for questions or just simply comments or what the people uh, want. Of course. Uh, if you don't mind. I have one question. Uh, give me some seconds because I have to make the translation from Spanish. Uh, good morning, the experiment. Uh, I think Freddy is going to present one of his examples. Freddy is the one, the person who made the question. The experiment help them to determine how many people could be involved in the build up of a house or a, a, stru a structure like this one. Uh -huh. uh, and she wonder how many people do you think that must need can be needed to build up a house like the one you have presented us? Um, when we work in on, on our reconstructions, we are five to six people. Only? <laughs> Yes, because um, we we have a limited number of tools mm -hmm. and can use it only one person, one tool. There are from ethnological record, um, there are facts from Africa and uh, Indonesia where people build very simple um, platform houses and they uh, gather together the whole community, the whole village, about 40 to 50 people building a house in just one week. Wow. There is one man who, yes, who leads the whole work, uh, conducts it all, maybe a carpenter or something like this. And he has all the knowledge and he um, advised people what to do and how to do it. And it's about 40 people. So maybe in history, it was the same in the stone age. We don't know, we actually don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Freddy uh, has understood uh, your your answer. If you have any problem, Freddy, you can you can write down uh, on the chat uh, any other question or just simply to clarify anything. Uh, if there is no questions, I will make some of of a question because I I enjoy. I think it's a very brilliant the presentation you 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 have shown us about the the uh, influence of a drawing in the perception of the past. 
Do you find any, a good example of uh, draws about house building? Yes, there are some. Um, there is there was one in in, in uh, a, a catalog and an um, exhibition catalog uh, exhibition which run in Berlin about three years ago. It was all about the Neolithic, and they engaged the Danish um, uh, graphic um, specialist uh, Fleming Bau. Uh -huh. He is very very skilled, and uh, before he starts uh, drawing, he visits museums and talks to people. Uh, who built the houses, asking them for, for details, for facts. So I think this is the best way. If you want um, um, a good drawing of a house, you have to contact the people. Uh, Irene Mejia is making another question. It's a, 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 a very promising question. Uh, she asks you, do you have any future plans? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Can Perhaps, you tell us? <laughs> yes. Uh, I I have a wish. I yes. wish I I wish I I would have been given enough money to build a house only using prehistoric techniques from scratch. No cranes, no chainsaws, no metal tools, no nothing. Yeah. And I would love to try to build a house that way. Yeah. I think this would be a um, huge amount of knowledge and experience you can yeah. you can obtain and gather during this process yeah yeah i know that there, there were some attempts uh, doing this in the netherlands last year and i'm not very sure uh, how they uh, succeeded in doing the whole process authentically but uh, i know that there was a plan to do this yeah okay uh, we have more, some more questions. One is coming from Marco Montelongo. Uh, he made the question, have you experienced living for, uh, there for a while? Um, I suppose in, on, on the houses, I mean in the houses. <laughs> no, not yet. Um, when we were building the houses at the Fidesi Museum in the end of the, of the 1990s, uh, I lived in, in, in one house which was ready already and uh, constructed the other ones. So I stayed in the house there, but it, this was no real living because I was outside all day and I had modern meals and modern clothing. But uh, I never stayed for a long time in the house. Mm -hmm. and, and did you have, by the way, did you have any problems of fighting, of fires in the houses or, uh, I mean, catastrophic fires uh, that, <laughs> that burn uh, the houses? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, the housekeeper of the museum, when we finished the first building, uh, he made a fire inside a big oil can, <laughs> like the Americans do, to heat up the house and to let, let the smoke go up into the roof because it's good against any animals biting away the wood mm. and insects. Okay. And he made the fire too big, so the flames went up to, to the roof and it was almost about burning down the house, but uh, the firemen came and they just had to uh, take an extinguisher and make one shh, and then yeah. it was gone. Yeah. So that's, they were really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, another question isn't coming because this is a kind of rolling, uh, continuous rolling of questions. Do you think yeah. this uh, structure will originally, originally build by all the community or just a group that would eventually uh, occupy the house? Oh, this is a question we are discussing in the, to ourselves. Yeah. Uh, a colleague of mine who is involved in these in these experiments too, uh, he says that there were no, ex no specialists at that time. Any man or any woman, we don't know, was able to do the essential things in the house buildings. My opinion is that there were specialists because um, if you don't have the the ability of special imagination to of, of uh, 3D thinking in advance to make a model of the house inside your head. You can't just start erecting some posts. You have to do measurement. You have to do the right measurement on, on the wood. You have to do the exact measurements in, in the connections between the wood. So I'd rather think that there were specialists. Like in the medieval times, there were those people who built all the cathedrals and all the churches. And uh, th they were specialized. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's okay. an ongoing discussion. 
Yeah, sure, for sure. Uh, the question was coming from Iker uh, Laiseka, uh, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if anyone has any other question or comment. Uh, there is, a, there is a question that always come around when, when you think about the possibility of making a reconstruction like the one you present us, is how to find money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have any any trick uh, to find it or uh, um, advice, any advice? Ask the European community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a program in Germany. I think it's in other countries too. It's called LEADER, L-A-R-D-E-R. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they spend money on on yeah poor poor countrysides where yes to develop them yeah. and often they spend money into museums to attract visitors attract tourists mm -hmm. so this is a pot where you can get some money from yeah if you're lucky <laughs> <laughs> crossing the fingers all the time <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> well if uh, if there is no more questions or comments uh, i will i will say just uh, well, thank you very much for staying you're with welcome, us. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I, I will share your picture, by the way, because okay. I, I want the people to know your face. And uh, well, again, thank you. Thank you very much. We we have a, um, a short break, uh, just to have a coffee or whatever you want, and we will restart. If I'm not wrong, uh, Tony, could you help me about the time? Here I have the schedule. We will restart at uh, seventeen. 10, so in four yes. minutes. Four okay. minutes, exactly. Four minutes. See you then again. Yes, yeah, see you. Bye. Bye. Wolf. Bye. Thank you very much, Wolf. You're welcome, Tony. Oh, bye. Bye bye. Bye.